What a welcome, right? Yeah, this is great. Well, first, guys, thank you so much for coming and joining us today, especially on a day that made me want to melt. Uh, it's very much appreciated, and we've got a lot of really interesting stuff to talk about. But let's, for the sake of the people here in the audience and the people watching us at home, let's lay out the broad strokes. Pencils of Promise, what is it and, and how did you guys sort of come to be involved? Sure. So uh, for those that aren't familiar, Pencils of Promise is a 501c3 organization. Mm -hmm. uh, most call it nonprofit. We like to think of ourselves as for purpose in nature. Uh, but it was founded in late 2008. Uh, I had been a college student, backpacking, traveling as much as I could earlier in life, and uh, had a habit of asking one child in each country that I went through a very simple question. And the question was, if you could have anything in the world, what would you want most? And I found a boy who was begging on the streets in rural India. I asked him that question, and his answer was a pencil, which was totally surprising for me. Uh, I gave him my pencil, he just lit up, and I realized this boy had never been to school before in his life, and that that uh, fundamental injustice existed for many millions of children around the world. And so several years later, uh, on the side of my job, I, I started uh, this organization, Pencils of Promise, inspired by that original child, um, in hopes of building one school with $25. And now it's uh, about seven years later, and we've broken ground on just over 300 schools around the world. Well, congratulations. That's, that's fantastic, right? Now, Leslie, uh, I've heard this through the grapevine. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, your involvement with Pencils of Promise sort of came about because of a chance meeting on an airplane with Adam, is that? Yeah, pretty much, actually. Okay. So I, I had bought a one-way ticket to fly to Laos. Uh, I was 25. That's incredibly brave. Yeah, well, it was something. Okay. It turned out well, though. Uh, one-way ticket, fly to Laos to move there. And when I was about to do that, I heard about this guy who someone knew on Facebook who had built one preschool. And I was a preschool teacher, so I Facebook messaged him. I was like, hey, I'm going to Laos. I teach preschool. We should talk. We talked on the phone, we were like, you like education, and Bob Dylan, let's talk more. And then we were accidentally on the same flight, the same little prop plane from Bangkok to Laos. And then I stayed there for three and a half years. And so in some small way, Bob Dylan is directly responsible for all these kids, yeah. kids getting an education? Definitely. I would think okay. definitely, yeah, it's safe to say. So let's, let's sort of dive into what it is you guys do. So it's, it's based on education, it's bringing uh, a sort of a more elaborate and more involved form of education to people who never really had it. And a lot of this hinges on technology. And, and at least from my vantage point, like for people doing what you guys do for a long, long time, it was about trying to get computers into these remote classrooms. And that sort of changed, am I right? Yeah, I mean, when we started, the, the ambition, I think, was you know, simple in its idea that every child on earth deserves access to a quality education. And we thought about that in terms of, well, there's a lot of children who, who don't even have a school to go to. You know, they learn under a tree or there's no you know, organization whatsoever for them to participate in during the day. And so we started out uh, very simply by working with communities directly to build schools. And what we saw pretty quickly was that uh, building those four walls was nice, mm -hmm. but the actual uh, vehicle that was driving those student outcomes was what happened inside of that classroom. And it started with the teacher. And then from the teacher, extended into opportunities to advance learning through technology. And so as we've evolved over the years, what started with this simple idea of building schools now, uh, with Leslie really overseeing all of our global impact across uh, four different countries headquartered here in the United States, mm -hmm. and then focused on three others across Latin America, Asia, and Africa, uh, technology we don't see as a solution in itself, but an enabler to accelerate new ideas and new solutions, which Leslie oversees. Sure. And Leslie, you have got probably one of the best titles I've seen in a long time. You are Pencils of Promises Director of Impact. Tell us a bit about what the impact is like on the ground and the tools that you guys use to sort of affect this impact. Yeah, so as Adam mentioned, we started really building schools. And that's what mm -hmm. we were in our first few years. We were a school building organization. There was a huge need, and so we sought out to meet that need. Um, for me personally, from spending time in the field, from being raised by educators, it is the teacher. The teacher is absolutely the answer. The teacher can unlock the future of a child. They can unlock the entire potential of that classroom and really bring everything to life. So everything we do is really aimed at providing them with the methods and materials to be more successful in their classroom. So sometimes it's tech, but like Adam said, that is not a solution. And we never want to think of it as a solution. It's mm -hmm. a vehicle. right? There's quality education, and whatever vehicle gets us there, we'll take it. <laughs> and right now, there's a lot of tech stuff that can help get us there. So that's what we're using, things like e-readers and tablets. Uh, tablets for testing so we can make sure that our metrics are showing, you know, that we're trending towards success and we can iterate on our programs when we need to make changes. Right. So that's what it's looking like right now. Do you guys make it a point to sort of have these tablets and e-readers available in all of your schools or tell me about the reach you guys are able to have with that? So it's, it's smaller right now and it's sure. growing. So for us, 
it is so important that we do what works. Uh, and that sounds, really, that sounds really basic, but a lot of people don't do that. Um, so you have to test things. So for example, we do self-organized learning environments, which are tablets used for student-centered learning to mm -hmm. access the internet. We're only doing it in two schools right now because it has to work first. We have to see the results. We have to see what's happening, how students are receiving it, teachers are receiving it, and what's happening with educational outcomes. So there's two schools in Ghana that have Seoul, and then about six or seven that have e-readers. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're using also tablets for testing, as I said. Our literacy tests are done on tablets when we go into the field in Guatemala and Ghana. And so as Adam has mentioned, most of the schools you guys are working on, Latin America, Africa, Asia, bringing this sort of technology to very young people, uh, very hungry for education, do you find that there's sort of a learning curve? Do you have any sense of, of how they react to dealing with this technology? Uh, there's no learning curve when you give it to a kid. When a kid, a kid's just like, oh, great, I can figure this out. Uh, a teacher, it takes a little while. We have to really work with a teacher. And a teacher needs to be comfortable using what their students are using. So we right. found that to be really key. Like, they need to feel very comfortable using the tablet. Because, again, a kid is a kid anywhere. They pick up a tablet and they, like, poke around with it for a second. They're like, oh, look what I did. <laughs> All right, I didn't figure out how to do that. So, so with the kids, no, they can totally latch right on. Teachers, we have to just really explain, make them kind of get a little more buy-in and feel confident with it. But generally, gotcha. it's really not that big of a hurdle. Gotcha. That's very cool. I, didn't, I think we can all sort of attest. I'm sure we've all given, like, iPhones to, like, nieces or nephews, and they're, like, three, and they're like, oh, yes, yeah. I've downloaded four apps <laughs> in the time since you've given me this device. Um, but as you guys have said, and I think this is really crucial, the tech is sort of ancillary to the impact of the teacher. And I think it might be fair to say you may or may not agree, but the quality of teachers in America is a problem that we're trying to, we're having to deal with. And that, that must be something you guys have to contend with sort of in these other sort of far-flung locations as well. What is it like picking teachers to sort of work in these schools that you've built from scratch? Well, we actually don't select the teachers. Okay. So part of our approach is to work directly with local education ministries. Mm -hmm. We build public schools. Any child in the village can attend that school. And the idea is that we want to create true systemic change. And mm -hmm. so all of the teachers come from the... Uh, countries in which we work, as does 95% of our staff. So we're not sending out Westerners to go do, gotcha. you know, okay. three months of volunteer. This is uh, all local staff. So our country director in Ghana is from Ghana. His staff is from Ghana. Our country mm -hmm. director in Lao, they're, they're Lao. Their staff is almost entirely Lao. Um, and so when we think about teachers, we want to work with the education ministry where they place a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, they train that teacher before they enter the classroom, but we provide a lot of supplemental training for that teacher once they've been placed so that they can see success for themselves and their students. Gotcha. Um, I wanted to sort of take a step back, if you will. So uh, you guys are coming up on your eighth anniversary in, in October, I think. Seventh. Seventh. Uh, congratulations. That's, that's got to be huge for you. Give it up. Thank exactly. We've, we've talked a bit about the number of schools that you guys have built, but what else do you feel like you've really accomplished in the past seven years? What are you really proud of so far? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot. I'm so, sure there's so, tons, so yeah. The, the, the <laughs> truth is, um, when the organization was founded, mm -hmm. it had a very big mission. That mission uh, originally was, was predicated on two things. So the first was transforming the way that children gained access to quality education right. abroad in these really difficult environments. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it was also around this idea that philanthropy should be something that is accessible by any person, regardless of age, status, or location. Mm -hmm. And so when the organization was founded in late 2008, back then, charity or philanthropy was seen as kind of the space of the privileged few wealthy individuals mm -hmm. and young people like many of the people that I'm looking at in this room, you don't participate, right? You don't have the power, you don't have the wealth. And so, you know, when we started out, beginning with $25, our first 10 schools were funded by contributions of $100 or less from no teens wow. and 20s in New York. Back then, you know, people didn't even have the phrase crowdsourcing. You know, they didn't use digital and social media the way that, that we started to as an organization. And so I would say that's one of the things that I think, you know, many of us are most proud about is not only the transformational impact that we have in the field with our students, but also the way that I think we've helped to shift the way that people think about creating good and, you know, positive social outcomes in their lives and their business and their family because Pencils of Promise has made it accessible for a lot of people that wouldn't have been able to access that otherwise. Gotcha. And, and what really strikes me about what you guys do is it's really not just mechanical changes. You're not just building schools. You're trying to, to sort of change perceptions and sort of build things that really weren't there within people, not just in the ground. But with regard to building schools, it sounds like there, there's room for a lot of sort of logistical nightmares. Could you talk to us a bit about the struggles that go into building these schools and, and teaching kids better. Yeah, so the, the school itself, we, we can do it now. We've got 304. Got the we know down. what we're doing. Yeah. Got it. 
Um, in the beginning, it was a lot harder. And in the beginning, I was overstaying it in Laos. And I don't exactly have a construction background. Um, so that was new, new to me, doing that with a, a Lao woman. We were kind of piecing it together, figuring it out, mm -hmm. but learning from other people. There were other organizations that had done it. The Ministry of Education had done it. Um, so that, it, there is a lot of room for, for a nightmare, but it hasn't really happened to us. And a lot of that is because we are sourcing all of our local labor in the village. So they're in charge of it, they're overseeing it, they're participating, meaning we don't have to have the same kind of right. level of, of eyes on it. So the expertise is there. You're just sort of making it a point to go and tap it. Absolutely. The expertise is there and the desire is there. That's gotcha. what the biggest part is. People are saying, we want education. We want better education for our children. So they're excited to partner to that end. Very cool. And Adam, I can't help but notice, so earlier on in our conversation, you sort of, uh, it's easy to look at Pencils of Promise as a non-profit, but that's not exactly fair. You refer to it, uh, you prefer to call it a for-purpose uh, sort of organization. What's, what's the distinction for you guys? Well, I mean, it kind of stemmed from this frustration that I had and that I'd, I, I've never thought of myself as a non-profit person. You know, mm -hmm. I'd been involved in organizations, but my entire background was as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you know, worked in finance, worked at Bain in, in consulting and whatnot. And, you know, I really like that space because people are held accountable to results. And yet I found myself in all these conversations with these great business leaders. And as soon as I said, I run a non-profit, uh, they just kind of, you know, they're turned off, their eyes glazed over. over, they looked for the next person to talk to. And I huh. thought... Why are we doing such a disservice to the work that we do? It's the only industry that introduces itself with mm -hmm. the word non. So I would never get off of a flight and go up to somebody on Delta and say, thank you for your non-automobile service today. <laughs> but, but, but that's what people do in this industry, and that's actually not what drives us to the work. It's mm -hmm. lifting people out of poverty uh, or you know, providing some service to the disadvantaged or increasing the sense of meaning and purpose in our own lives. And I felt like nonprofits kind of get this free pass. Right. You know, you give them money and you think, oh, suddenly I've made the world better. But the reality is you haven't unless the organization delivers on its mission. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to kind of reframe our language. You know, I really believe in this idea. You change your words to change your worth. And uh, ultimately, we said, let's think of ourselves as a for-purpose. Yes, we're a 501c3 nonprofit technically. Right. But let's hold ourselves uh, accountable to a higher standard and treat ourselves like a great business mm -hmm. uh, and have the head of a great for-profit and the heart of a great nonprofit with a humanitarian mission. Do you think, and, and this might be an unpopular question, but I'm curious anyway. So do you think on some level those investors, those, those VCs, those people you've talked to who sort of glaze over when you mention nonprofit and sort of, I guess, maybe wish you were sort of a, a for-profit organization, do they have a point? Could a for-profit organization do more than what you're able to do right now? I think it totally depends on the market that you're trying to address. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's certain for-profits that can address education in really big, scaled, incredible ways. Mm -hmm. But the people that we seek to service, uh, I think it's incredibly difficult to serve through a for-profit model, and that's why we approached it through the nonprofit model. We didn't do this because we said, hey, we want to go into poverty. <laughs> we, we did this because he said we want to serve those that don't have access to quality education and a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit is the best model to approach it. But, um, you know, I think that those VCs often find a lot of uh, pleasure, truthfully, in funding Pencils of Promise because huh. they can hold us accountable to the same type of results and the expectation of great outcomes that uh, they would hold any for-profit to. Gotcha. And let's, let's zoom out even further. So we've seen where you guys have come from, what you guys have built so far, and obviously it's pretty incredible stuff. But let's take a step back and look at the next five years, the next 10 years. Where do you want Pencils of Promise to be within the next, say, five years? Well, I mean, I can give my short answer, and then uh, Leslie's the one that's going to take us there. Okay. So I'll, I'll put the pressure on her. <laughs> um, I really want Pencils of Promise to be seen as one of the leading global education organizations, mm -hmm. and that's top to bottom. That's from the way that we drive outcomes for our students to the way that we engage our, our supporters and our donors, our staff, mm -hmm. uh, to the, the way that our brand communicates how we do our work, that we're uplifting, that we're never going to guilt somebody mm -hmm. into making a contribution. Um, and I hope that ultimately, uh, if you look at the history of, of disruptive innovation, it never occurs kind of at the core. It's always on the fringes and the, the low-value consumers. Huh. And if you think about trying to push forward education innovation in this country, it's very difficult because of all the entrenched interests, whereas mm -hmm. where we work, we can really you know, put some incredibly new and innovative ideas out there, get them adopted, grow them really quickly. And so mm -hmm. my hope is that one day the way that a child is educated in New Jersey or the Bronx or Oakland is impacted by something that we discovered in the classroom in rural Ghana or Guatemala or Laos through Pencils of Promise. Cool. So I think there's three things for me that are really important. One is that we are radically transparent with everything we do. 
The other is that we are actually true partners with the government. The word, we actually mean that word. We don't just say it because it's a great sound bite. Uh, and, the third is that, and the third is that we're getting real outcomes from students. And again, I know that sounds kind of basic, but a lot of organizations aren't holding themselves to that standard. You're mm -hmm. saying, great, there's the school, done, excellent. That's not, there's so much more that has to go into it. And you have to be willing to really look, look at yourself and say, like, that thing that I really thought was going to work isn't working at all. Mm -hmm. So I need to change it. Or I need to change my strategy. I need to change everything. And you have to be willing to iterate and do that. And so I think that's, that's really where we're at. And I want us to be, as you were kind of saying, from top to bottom, truly transparent. I want everyone to be able to look at us and say, like, oh, remember time, that time that Pop tried that thing that didn't work? And how they, you know, owned up to it and talked about it mm -hmm. and changed it and did it better. That's the kind of organization that we, we really want to be. And it takes our partnerships with our governments to get there that are really... It is hard to work with local governments. It's hard to work with probably governments across the board. <laughs> um, but to work with governments that are different from us, have different rules, different standards, it's really difficult. But that's systemic change. That's where it will happen. Um, so that, for me, for the next five years, is a huge push. And i got to say, as a startup person, I love the fact that you guys sort of don't mind failing fast, right? You sort of figure you out. Have oh, yeah. You have to. I mean, in this line of work, you know, again, if, if you ran a for-profit company and at the end of the year, uh, you just sent out a photo of your smiling employees. People wouldn't be okay with that, right? <laughs> but that's how uh, charities operate. You know, if you just send out photos of your smiling beneficiaries, people are like, great, you know, I feel good. You did a good job. Uh, and so we, we want to be held to a higher standard, and that means that we need to be failing frequently. Otherwise, we're not trying hard enough because this is a really, really big issue, and it's one that we deeply care about, you know, helping to solve. And Leslie, sort of to your point about working with governments, when it comes time to build schools, do you, do you sort of approach or try to build them in countries where you have working relationships that, that sort of function properly? Or do you go where, where education is needed and then try and negotiate ways to work with these governments? We start with places that we know the government wants to partner with us. Okay. The government needs to be a willing and able partner. Okay. And I guess let's, let's bring it a bit closer to home. Uh, obviously, you guys are doing some really interesting work and, and really important work. Uh, I don't think that can be understated. But I think a lot of the people in this room and a lot of the people watching this and a lot of the people just walking down the street also care about education as an issue. What, what can we be doing better? We're not all going to start nonprofit slash for purpose slash for profit companies to do this. What's, what can we be doing? Well, I think there's a few things. The first is you, know, you find the issue that you care about most. And, mm -hmm. and ideally, I really believe you have to find it from a sense of purpose, not just passion. Mm -hmm. I think passion is vastly overrated. <laughs> uh, pa passion is fleeting, right? I feel passionate about this today. A week from now, I might feel passionate about something else. Mm -hmm. If you find something that you genuinely believe resonates with your core, why you are here, mm -hmm. your very existence is predicated on achieving this thing, then, then that drives you with a level of motivation that's unparalleled. And so I think if that's education for you, then one, you should find a great organization that really resonates, that you know, kind of speaks to your heart, soul, and mind, and, and you say you know, something, I believe in this, I think this is the right leadership, the right staff, the right you know, end goal, and, and this is what I want part of my stamp to be, and then you get involved with that great organization. And, and you know, part of our job is not necessarily to go out and do the work, but to find channels for other people to get involved mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense for them. And so you know, that could be as a board member. Right? A lot of people out there don't realize how much value they can bring as a board member. That could be a part-time volunteer, or that could just be you know, reading up uh, on the latest books and articles that are coming out on the space, and then making sure that that's a part of your family's conversations, because education is multi-generational, and it starts in the home. Gotcha. And this, uh, this might be a bit more self-indulgent, but I, I'm a tech reporter, and I'm always curious to kind of pick people's brains about it, rather. Uh, the tech community plays home to a lot of money and a lot of resources. What do you think, if anything, the tech community could be doing to better help people who want to learn around the world? Well, I mean, I would say the tech community is actually doing a lot right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the level of investment from venture capital into ed tech is mm -hmm. at an all-time high. I think it was close to $2 billion last year, and it's mm -hmm. only increasing. So I think for the first time in a while, they're actually seeing a huge amount of promise. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is that they should look at you know, not just mobile apps and kind of the, the latest fad around how money could be made off of this opportunity, but look for ideas that truthfully have a high likelihood of failure, but if they work, would be completely transformational for the entire industry. Mm -hmm. And a couple of those places are, one, in the environments where we work, you know, creating transformational technology for low-income communities across the developing world. And then, you know, separately, I think there's 
a lot of opportunities in higher education in this country, which is really the basis of how we form a future generation of leaders that will not only you know, impact the nonprofit space and education, but you know, hopefully solve a lot of the issues that we all collectively care about. Amazing, thank you. Uh, quick warning to the people in the audience, we're coming up to question and answer time, so if you've got something kicking around, be sure to verbalize that and come up with something good for our uh, two guests here. But my final question to you, and it's gonna be a little grim. Uh, we've talked a lot about hope, let's bring it dark. Let's get dark here. <laughs> let's say that you've died. What would you like your obituaries to say? You can take that first. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was coming here today, our, we had our headshots and we checked in downstairs uh -huh. and Adams had his headshot and said author and mine said, had my headshot and said education enthusiast. I was like, yeah, I like mine. That's what I am, an <laughs> education enthusiast. So, yeah. That's cool, it. awesome. Yeah. And Adam? Um, you know, left the world better than the way that uh, he inherited it. That's, that's really, I think, what drives me most is, is to try and... You know, we obviously entered all of us in a really great place and we're really all fortunate to have this life that we all share and I think each of us has a duty to improve it. Awesome. Well, let's give our guests a quick round of applause here. And now we're going to turn the microphones over to the people in the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, I think we've got a mic floating around somewhere, perhaps. There we go. Hi, good day. Hi. Uh, congrats on POP. My question is, um, how do you manage to surpass those who might not believe in or support um, Pencils of Promise? Ooh, that's a good one. Wish I asked that. <laughs> um, well, the reality is the vast majority of people that we interact with don't actually get involved. I mean, if, if I've, you know, I do a lot of speaking on behalf of the organization, and if I've spoken in front of, you know, 30,000 people, I know the conversion rate is one or two percent actually make this a meaningful part of their life. Um, but my hope is that each of those individuals that didn't choose to support Pencils of Promise find something else. Because over time you come to realize there are different issues that are really important to different people. And those evolve over the course of your life. Your family might be affected by a certain disease and suddenly that's really your thing. Or in your backyard you watch an injustice and suddenly you say, I need to address homeless youth in New York City, and that might be important to you. And so I never see it as a, as a sense of failure on our behalf if somebody doesn't choose to get involved in our work, but my hope is that if they're passionate about our issue, which is international education, that we are the right organization for them, and if not, at least we're hopefully able to um, help them recognize the power that they have to affect another issue that they care about deeply. Awesome question, thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, so I'm a nanny and I read up a lot on how technology affects children. And there's all of those studies out there that say that like handheld devices, tablets, e-readers, stuff like that are detrimental and um, are not good for your attention span and stuff. Do you think that that's true in the third world is, or is that just an American thing? Well, it's, it's not overused nearly as terrifyingly as much as it is here because, yeah, I mean, it will eventually melt your brain if that's all you're doing is using an iPad as a child. Um, I, it's something to keep in mind. That is really why, particularly with tech solutions, it's one, it's one tool in the toolkit for a teacher. It's one tool for the student. It is not the answer. It's maybe this, this uh, tablet makes sense for this activity, but also being outside makes sense for that one, and a group activity makes sense for this. So I think really using it in small doses, um, in small doses it has a huge amount of power. So we just, we don't see the same sort of like lack of attention span abroad as we're seeing here. Hi, so Pencils of Promise has provided over a million hours in education, but how do you plan on helping children post-secondary education? Sure, so, um, you know, one of the things that you realize as you grow and scale an organization is how important focus is. And uh, as an education organization, we could try and be all things to all people, and at different stages in our growth, we've gone out and done kind of supporting ancillary components of the program. We've built dormitories, we've focused on scholarships. We, we have a lot of programs. We have one called WASH, which is around water and sanitation and health education, that's a UNICEF. Uh, created program and at a certain point in time you just say where can we create the deepest impact and at scale and so for us uh, We decided that that was really in the primary area uh, and so we focus on primary education We try and provide as many supportive services as we can and then when it came to secondary because we saw There was a really significant dropout in particular for girls going on to secondary We created a scholarship program and so we have a scholarship program to send students on 
to secondary, but part of that for us, again, is around the focus of primary education impact so that students and parents know that if they complete our primary schools, there is at least an opportunity for them to progress to secondary. And we are doing something that we know has proven outcomes later in life. So that's really what we can hinge on, is we know that when you are literate, we know when you're numerate, we know when you've had a basic education, your opportunities, your potential vastly grow. That for yourself, your family, your country, your GDP increases, everything grows if you can make it through the fifth grade. So we're really kind of hinging on that fact. Hey guys. Um, uh, aside from um, helping the third world countries, how do you guys feel about the budget cuts happening here um, in the United States? Uh, it's really disheartening. Uh, the truth is, you know, I think part of what has made this country so great and what's gotten it to where it is is the collective investment in the education of our youth. And as you look at what's going on at the federal level and at the state level, there's drastic cuts in education across the board, and I think it's a real shame. That's, that's the reality of it. And you know, the one thing that I can kind of go back to is um, the resilience and the entrepreneurial spirit uh, that founded this country. And my sense is Americans are the type of people that say, okay, if I don't have the right opportunity here, then I'll find my way into the opportunity that I'm seeking. And so my hope is it doesn't hold people down. I think there, there's two, some people that are really, yeah, that are resilient and bouncing back. I'm a little bit biased, but there's this small town called Dallas, Oregon, where I'm from. Uh, and my dad, again, a little biased, is a superintendent. Um, but being able to watch, he's been in this school district for 30 years, being able to watch that whole thing really like from the inside out and seeing what has to go into to fixing the system when everything is going against it has been amazing. He works with the most amazing teachers and people who have true resilience that, you know, all this outside stuff is happening that is really not going for them. Um, but watching it happen from the inside out is pretty amazing. Last question. Yes, yeah, so as you were saying, uh, there's a lot of budget cuts here in the U.S. I want to see uh, what you all doing also in the U.S. as well, and also were there any scholarship funds you are providing towards college tuition for a lot of these students when they grow older and they want to go on to college and expand their education even further? Yeah, I mean, so again, it, come back to, it comes back to focus for us and where can we have the greatest impact. You know, I would say about... Four years into the organization, we did a bunch of work to look at ourselves really you know, deeply in the mirror and say, okay, why do we exist and where can we have the biggest um, kind of ripple effect? And for us, that was in rural communities across the developing world, the kind of next dollar effect in terms of how does an additional dollar you know, kind of compound in, in someone's life out there? It, it, it's, it's on a totally different scale. Um, and so our focus is not domestic education. That said, you know, our entire kind of foundational base is you know, domestic, oftentimes youth, or kind of digitally savvy individuals. Uh, it costs us $25,000 to build a full school that will transform a community for generations. Uh, that's less than a lot of people pay for you know, a year in college. Um, and so you know, what we look at also is our staff. Um, we don't provide college scholarships currently, but a lot of our staff are those individuals who grew up in the communities where we work, and we provide a lot of supportive services for them to advance their education and professional development. Awesome. Great, great questions. Thank you so much for that. And really, a heartfelt thanks from us to you, Adam Thank and you, Leslie. guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Great job. Thank you for joining us today.